welcome to this special episode of Rattling the Bars. We are taking a minute to recognize the 55th anniversary of the Black Panther Party. So joining me today is Billy Jennings, Black Panther historian, archivist, and lifelong member. Billy, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Uh, Billy, just give me a little background on what's going on in Oakland tomorrow or on the 15th of October, which will be the 55th anniversary. What's happening in Oakland? Well, actually, the whole month of October is Black Panther Party History Month. And it's so because the Black Panther Party was started in October 1966. So 55 years later, Black Panther Party members are coming together to celebrate our legacy. And what we've, we've had a number of events so far. Uh, the first of the month, we had a art show that started that steady flow of people are coming to on a daily basis at the George Gordon Gallery. So this is an everyday thing for the whole month. Then on the ninth, last Saturday, we had the artist talk, former members of the Black Panther Party newspaper, Emory Douglas, Malik Edwards from Washington, D.C., and uh, Gail Asali Dixon, and a young brother named Reefer One um, spoke uh, on the legacy of the Black Panther Party newspaper and artwork today. Uh, the brother Reefer One's mother and father were Panthers, so he's what we call a Panther cub. He is one of the most premier muralists in the Bay Area. Uh, to his credit, his group has done six or seven big murals in related to the Black Panther Party legacy. When you come to Oakland and you go downtown Oakland, you will be amazed to see Emory Douglas's art in three or four locations right in the center of downtown. There's a big portrait of Bobby Hutton there right on 14th and Broadway. Even the the Marriott Hotel, which is a chain group, a chain organization hotel, they have a panther on their logo to honor the Black Panther Party in, in Oakland. So the whole month long has been an educational period. And what we got going on this weekend is that we have a number of historical signs are being put up in, in historical locations. Billy, you said earlier that Part of this whole month celebration was about the legacy of the Black Panther Party. In your opinion, what is the legacy of the Black Panther Party? Um, the legacy of the Black Panther Party is uh, self-determination, uh, liberation struggle, social programs, uh, fighting to free our people. That is our... That is our legacy. You know, Black Panther Party stood up for the oppressed people, uh, and, and we did it in many types of manner. Uh, our legacy is to fight for the community, be the guardians of the community, uh, and help the community unify and get what they need. Okay. And, and we did that through social programs, you know, breakfast for school children program, free food programs, uh, medical clinics. Black Panther Party had 13 medical clinics. Two are still open to this very day. One in Seattle, Washington, and dental clinic in Portland. So our legacy still lives on in many types of forms. Just, uh, just recently, most Americans might have read the article in, in, in the New York Times about the Dis uh, Disability Act of 1977. And many people didn't know the Black Panther Party had anything to do with that. You know, we had a spokesperson that went to Washington, D.C. His name was Brad Lomax. He was a, uh, he started the Black Panther Party in Washington, D.C. at Howard University, got ill and had to uh, take a couple of years to recuperate. But he came out to California and he helped the disabled people uh, lead their struggle in 77 and 78. To, so that they can have Disability Act in 1977. So there's a lot of legacy history about the party that hasn't even been brought out yet. And and I think, and I will add uh, add to that, uh, the, the need for, at that time when the, the Black Panther Party uh, was formed, 
uh, in 66, there was a need to uh, defend yourself. Organizers needed to defend themselves. We were losing people in the uh, rivers in Mississippi. People were being shot in their driveways. Uh, uh, organizers were being assassinated. And one of the things that the founders of the party said was that if we were going to organize, then we needed to be prepared to uh, protect ourselves and defend ourselves. So I think one of the legacies is that Black people have a right to be armed and a right to defend themselves. And uh, that's more evident today than it was at any other given time. Uh, and I think probably uh, the other legacy of the Black Panther Party uh, would be the international socialist uh, ideology. Uh, that was the first time that uh, in the Black community and in other communities that there was live examples of how socialist programs work and it made those programs acceptable. The community came together collectively and fed the children collectively. Uh, they came together collectively and did those things that you said in terms of the health clinics, the free bus rides to prisons, uh, free clothes, uh, free food programs. Uh, there's a health clinic here in Maryland now that even though the Black Panther Party didn't start it, we created the foundation for it and it, other people grabbed it up and built it and it still exists today uh, uh, as the ambulance services and so on. So Billy, you have been keeping an archive. Uh, we we'll talk, talk about It's About Time in the archives that you've been keeping. Okay. Well, It's About Time came about in 1995, about 25 years ago. Uh, I live in Sacramento, California, which is maybe about 80, 90 miles from the city of Oakland. Uh, I left Sacramento in 1988 and moved to New York, Queens, New York. And while I was gone, they were having a housing development here in Sacramento where many people from the Bay Area moved to Sacramento because they could sell their houses in the Bay Area for a large amount of money. And I also buy houses here, brand new houses for $250,000, right? So when I got back, there was a, a, a large amount of Panthers here that moved here, living in different locations. So our kids are all the same age and they kind of congregate together. So one day we were at a soccer game and one of our members said, hey, our 30th anniversary is coming up. So we started organizing for the 30th anniversary, which was in 1996, and we stayed together ever since. From that point, I became like the editor of It's About Time newsletter. And I started sending out information about the party and so forth. 1998, we came online and started our website. And that was really the glue, that website. It was able to reach many Panthers all over the world. And so I started, just started gathering information on the legacy of the party, chapter by chapter. And so today I have, uh, well, It's About Time has one of the biggest collections of Black Panther art uh, material around. Uh, we have newspapers, we have uh, interviews taped in on tapes, on DVDs. Uh, we have traveling um, exhibits, like we've been to Australia, New Zealand, Portugal, London, Ireland, uh, Tanzania, traveling with our exhibits. So, you know, the world of the Panther is still alive in many parts. Just in June, a few months ago, the Polynesian Panthers, who came into being in 1970, 1970s, had their 50th anniversary. You know, they sent us shirts and uh, statements of support. And when we had our 50th year reunion, they came over to Oakland, about 13 of them, you know. So the Black Panther Party is, is, is worldwide. And our archive is worldwide. We get information from all over, put it on our website. So any young student in the community anywhere or anybody doing research on the party will have a viewpoint from the uh, rank and file. Like our website is focused at the rank and file. We don't have a lot of stuff on about Huey and, and, and Eldridge and stuff like that because they are well covered. It's the people like 
Steve McClutchin. It's people like uh, 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 Aaron Dixon, different people in different geographical locations doing great work that people don't know about. And that's what we focus on. So we gather information. You, you know, if you have uh, any questions about the Black Panther Party, you can go to our website and hopefully you can find out. If not, you can always email me and I try to get back to people within 48 hours, you know? So, okay. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. So do you have any thoughts from, from your experience? I mean, you were the officer of the day at the national headquarters for a number of years and you've been operating there uh, in that area for a long time. Do you have any thoughts to share with young people today that uh, that's thinking about organizing or that's organizing now? Yes, I do. I try to give them a little background to what you're doing. Just like a lot of young people that are in Black Lives Matter and different groups, they're talking about defunding the police. But I think I gave them a little background to that, that that was a Black Panther Party idea that came out of the United Front Against Fascism in 1969. And at that time, it was called Community Control of Police, right? So we try to give background to people who uh, are, 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 are struggling, you know, uh, because their struggle is not new. You know, the Black Panther Party fought on many fronts, you know, economic front, uh, uh, dealing with the police. Just like, just like you mentioned before, uh, when the party first started, we carried law books with us. Not only guns, but law books. But history has dissected these law books right out of our arms. We used to quote right to the police because the police didn't know the law. So I would say to any person to do your research, Black Panther Party, if the requirement it, to be in a party is to read two hours a day. And what I suggest people to do is look back into the legacy of the Black Panther Party and other groups and see how they operated. Because in the party, uh, out of the Red Book, there's a quote, uh, a falling to the pit is a gaining your wit, right? So mistakes have been made, and you can learn, different groups can learn from the mistakes the Black Panther Party made so they won't commit the same mistakes. So that's the, that's that's the power of history because history is a weapon. Okay, all right, and I, I would add to that uh, the one of the things that uh, that caused the destruction of the Black Panther Party was the United States government, the Cointel Pro operations, uh, and their inability to deal with. Uh, changing the conditions in the black community. So they opted to destroy the Black Panther Party rather than to see the black community uh, gather a, a level of power and independence and use its resources. Um, so we still have that same problem with the government today. Uh, and that problem will be around tomorrow. So like you say, young people need to look at the example, study from it, learn from the mistakes, but don't take it as a defeat because they have to recognize that uh, the Black Panther Party, a few thousand, tens of thousands maybe, uh, was fighting a government that was uh, an empire. Yep, because COINTELPRO, uh, during the time I was working at Century Headquarters, I was working directly with Hugh P. Newton uh, actually, I was his aide during 1971, and during that time, it came out in the, the Watergate papers that uh, Huey P. Newton was uh, on the public enemy's number one list. And because I was his aide, I was targeted by the FBI, and I was drugged in the court for, uh, for draft evasion. But uh, due to the fact that they discovered COINTELPRO uh, in 1970, uh, in Philadelphia, and my lawyer at that time got a copy of it, and when I went to court, he asked the government for every document they had on me, because every document they had on me had to be about you, because that's who I was working with. So when I went to court, they dropped my case because they didn't want to reveal how closely they was watching you. So all the program, no matter what our programs were, what who we were helping the government did not like it because we was causing contradiction for them because the, the breakfast for school children program was a contradiction to them 
And here we are, this black group feeding thousands of kids. The government's not feeding anybody. But during that same time, they're shoot, shooting rockets to the moon, burning up millions of dollars, you know? And people say, hey, nobody lives on the moon. You need to do something about the kids in the community. So that's how the government was forced into the breakfast program. Because the, the government was forced into opening up more hospitals in the black community because the Black Panther Party was doing so. We forced the government to divulge information and do more research on sickle cell anemia. The Black Panther Party was a force. And not and behind us and supporting us was the community. You know, they liked what we were doing, you know. Mm -hmm. So the Pro was anti-people. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to add one thing too, because you you had said it earlier about the Polynesian Panthers. And I think it's important to understand that Black Panther Party sprung up in India. Uh, Black Panther Party sprung up in Israel. They uh, sprung up in Africa, uh, in the Caribbean, in uh, Europe. Uh, Black Panther Party sprung up uh, all around the world. Uh, and, uh, and sister and brother companion parties, like the Brown Berets, et cetera, uh, also sprung up and took the example and took the platform in most parts of the Black Panther Party, even though they had different names. Uh, they were Brown Berets or Red Berets or, or um, Rainbow Berets or whatever. There were even senior citizen Black Panthers. Uh, Gray Panthers. Uh, the Gray Panthers, <laughs> you know. So um, the, the legacy uh, lives on in the sense that the Black Panther Party reached a lot of people and that in itself terrorized the government because of the ideology that was spreading about unity. Uh, and it was, it was a, a serious effort to always paint the Black Panther Party as being anti-white and being a black nationalist racist organization. And, but because we work so close with the anti-war movement, the Peace and Freedom Party and other white organizations, and there were even white Panther Party. Uh, there was even a White Panther Party. Uh, well, that's because the party was a vanguard. We set the example yeah. at the tone. Uh, uh, when the Black Panther Party newspaper came out, we showed them how a community paper should look. The Young Lords, the, the Young Patriot Party, all these different groups, papers are modeled after the Black Panther Party. You know, and our 10-point program is universal. That's, that's why we moved away from just saying Black power and moved power to the people. You know, yes, we're more as we learn, we got more uh, humanistic, you know, in our views, you know, and people picked that up uh, and, and adopted our 10 point program, you know, all over the world and saying they start following our example. So uh, the Black Panther Party was a powerful force, uh, left a heavy footprint for anybody to follow. And we are going to end on that note right there. All right, okay. comrade, all power to the people. Uh, all proud to the people. All, all right. right. Thank, you. thank you for joining me. Okay. And thank you for joining this special episode of Rattling the Bars, recognizing the 55th anniversary of the Black Panther Party.